Um, can we talk a little bit about that? The things that po poetry exists in, the, word, the words that really interest me are in opposition and can't touch. So how does it, let's talk about how it exists in, in opposition. <clears throat> okay, um, I think, I mean, when I'm, when I'm talking about information, I'm talking in a, there's many different definitions of information, obviously. Um, I was talking to a neuroscientist last week who said in the last 10 years, we have created more information as a species than we had in, in the whole of history up to that point um, because of the explosion in, in technology and the, the ways of capturing data um, and the interest that we have now in, in collecting information. So by information, I'm talking really about um, books and video images and, and audio recordings and, and that kind of stuff that's put out there as a way of educating yourself, I suppose, mm. learning about what's out there and learning about the world. Um, I think poetry exists in opposition to that in the sense that um, there is a sort of language of information that we are encouraged to use, perhaps in these kinds of situations, right, where we're trying to explain ideas. Um, there's something I keep hearing about, which is the globalised, transparent economy of knowledge. Yes. <laughs> Um, and I should say this as somebody who, who worked as a librarian and studied librarianship and has a degree in information studies. Um, it's in many ways a very wonderful thing. On the other hand, there's something about the easy transfer of fact and the easy transfer of knowledge that is in some ways just inimical and unrecognisable to us as complicated human yes. beings. It always involves a simplification. So I'm interested in the way that poetry means put it very simply, poetry means many, many different things at once. Um, and if you wrote a, a scholarly article that meant many, many different things at once, you'd probably get it back with notes from the readers at the journal saying, clarify this, clarify this. So that, that sense of poetry sending lights in many different directions and ca casting many different kinds of shadows and, and being um, Truthful in the sense of Adrian Rich's idea of truth, which is an increasing complexity, rather yes. than truthful in, in the terms of being factual, I suppose. Yes, I mean, Hardy says something about when he was approaching poetry, um, that he felt that it could get him away from crystallised opinion. And he said if Galileo had been able to say that the, the earth moved in a poem, he, the Inquisition might have left him alone, <laughs> which is probably not at all true, but yeah, I, you absolutely. get the idea. And in yeah, the poem true. Sulis in the, the new book, uh, you say, water like wisdom resists capture, never complacent, revising itself. And that reminded me, of course, of Bishop and at the mm. fish houses and, and where she says, it's like what we imagine knowledge to be mm -hmm. dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free. And it's, it's the the freedom of knowledge within the poem, perhaps, that, that resists the context of information. Yes. And, and it's the, the, the water being too clear. I mean, there's something that, that Philip says about, um, in the book about the sea, the, the sea inside, the water is so clear, it scares me. Mm -hmm. And poetry doesn't offer the furniture or apparatus of information. It, it offers a kind of clarity that we can't give proper shape yeah. or give reassuring shape yeah. to, perhaps. Yeah, I suppose poetry is the, the, the kind of writing I've found that for me most closely approaches the condition of reality, which yeah. is that you are confronted with something, nobody's telling you how to read it, you don't know what the intention was behind it necessarily unless you get into a conversation with somebody, but even then it's their view that you're getting, it's very partial, and it's, it's something that you have to have an encounter with. Um, you have an encounter with a poem and the poem looks at you perhaps in the way that you know the whale looked at Philip earlier as well you know you're being read by the poem at the same time as the poem is reading you and this is the way that we feel when we encounter reality yes. you know we're not um, there are no handholds and Lowell saying um, it's not the record it's an event not the record yeah. of an event so it it, it happens to you uh, yeah. a poem really um, it makes me think this idea that, that trying to keep your writing true to to real experience in that sense makes me think about um, perception and the veering nature of, of perception and feeling how quite often we feel either too close or too far away or inadequately grasping something. And there's a line that leaped out at me in one of the new poems. Um, just 
where has it gone? It's hidden itself. Um, that made me think about perception that was, that, the not, that we have this idea that we're looking in a kind of measured, consistent way, but we're not. Everything is either sort of inadequate or overwhelming. Perhaps it's just me. <laughs> I certainly recognize that in your work. Yeah. And, and it was in the poem A Token about the cocktail umbrella, the little right. cocktail umbrella yeah. sitting on the shelf. There's this line, you'd miss it at first and then find it garish. So there's nothing in between. There's the, the, the not noticing. Right. And then there is, oh, that's too, that's a little bit too yeah. much. Yeah, yeah. Um, I said it's one of, one of the things I really like about poetry as a form is that I really, I feel very free just to go wherever my attention directs me. And when I'm writing well, there is a feeling or perhaps an illusion um, that whatever I turn my attention to becomes poetic. Mm -hmm. There is a, a sense that you've, you've accessed some kind of way of perceiving or that there's, I don't know, something has come into alignment in your brain for a certain period of time that allows you to experience almost everything as poetry. And the, the poets I really love are people who seem to be able to do that consistently in their work. Bishop is one of them. Yeah. So really anything she puts her eye on becomes obviously brilliant subject matter for a poem. Why did nobody look at that before and write about it in that way? Or someone like Rilke who could just wake up in the morning and there's poems everywhere. You know, he's just pulling them out of the air. That kind of, that, that state is the ideal state. I mean, it's not always like that. Do you really think it was a continuous state for Bishop or Rilke? Or do you think that, because you're, you're, it's, it interests me, you're talking about it, it as a capacity yeah. um, that could, be, could focus itself on anything. Um, yes, I, I'm not, I, think, I don't want to suggest yes. that they existed in some kind of continuous romantic dream of inspiration. No, no, I wasn't anything, suggesting. No. Just that I'm very interested in this take of it, that, that it's coming entirely from within and, could, and, it, and it's a form of observation and formulation that um, doesn't need particular qualities in its subject. Yes, yeah, I'd agree with that. No, there's oh. an essay by an American poet called William Matthews, who I know very little else about, but I encountered an essay by him when I was quite young, sort of formative stage. Um, where he said, dull subjects are those we have failed. <laughs> and I always really liked that. As a poet, I thought, yes, you, yeah. you know, you, sh you, should, you should be able to make hay out of anything, really. Do you try to do that? I think so. I think, and, and, and it's partly from um, that, that sense of wanting to follow whatever I'm struck by mm -hmm. and see what's there. Also out of just fear, fear of writing about tired stuff, yeah. fear of writing about subjects that have been exhausted or images that have been exhausted. Hence my anxiety in the, the National Gallery Commission about how on earth yes. do you write about Actian in 2012 when I was asked to yeah. do it without just recycling everything. Yeah. I'm very struck by a line in The Shrunken Head about, um, I'll just get it so I quote it properly, I cannot see for bubble wrap. And I connected that to your phrase, indestructible attention splatter. And this idea that, that the information world we live in um, is almost like sort of visual barnacles. And we're, yeah. we're, it, it accretes, information accretes, and it obstructs and occludes our vision like bubble wrap. Yeah, absolutely. Really. And it, it literally does accrete in the sense that, you know, the more time you spend online, the more information, e.g. Google, has about your browsing habits, and yes. the more it shapes and directs what kind of information you actually have access to in, say, in a search, mm -hmm. or what types of news stories get flashed across your screen. And so and these types of um, dynamic attention filters are literally mm -hmm. present as mm -hmm. well. You talked about Sir Ferris, who you're working on some translations of, and uh, the epigraph for the new book is, you have two epigraphs, one yeah. is from him, and it, it's where he's talking about, I work with this marble head in my hands. And he goes on to say, it was falling into the dream as I was falling out of the dream. And I wanted us to talk a little about the, the deliberate ambiguity of both those lines. So talk, right, so holding a head in your hands, even though the word marble mm. detaches us from it. Um, at the same time, the head in the hands is, of course, the poet's own head. Yeah. So it's that sense of working with something which is um, the, uh, there is your head, your, your sort of poetic state, and then there is the idea of it, uh, mm. the marble version. Mm. Um, is that what it feels like at all? Do you, do you have any sense when poems taking shape in you, 
of of the the idea of it, or, or some sort of preceding thing? Are you resisting? Because you talked about resisting obvious images. Are you? Do you resist a poem taking a shape that feels too artfully familiar? Or um... I I would hope that I do. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I think there are all different kinds of mannerisms that you can pick up along the way, and that you learn from reading, and particularly from. Don't get bogged down in, you know, what poetry books are winning prizes and stuff like that, because you just... Yeah. <laughs> there's this, this terrible tendency of the establishment to reward people who are doing things with, with great um, facility that have, that have been done in other forms already, mm -hmm. I feel. Um, so I'm quite alert to that, and I, I would like to think that, that formally I'm trying to resist mm -hmm. any default shapes... The idea of us emerge. holding marble heads just makes me think of all the things we have to resist in order to find the, the, the thing. Yeah. Um, it's a heavy, bulky thing, and you working with it in your hands is, is sort of incapacitating. Yes, and um, that's very much on Seferis's mind as a, a yes. Greek, contemporary Greek poet, yes. thinking about you know, yeah. being part of that yeah. tradition, and how do, you, how do you have the temerity or the... Yeah. the the skill to try and even begin to place yourself in, in a lineage like that. And the other line there, it was falling into the dream as I was falling out of the dream, brings us to tension and mm. counterweight and weight yeah. and pressure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I, I was attracted as well to the word dream. Like my first book yeah. is called Public Dream, and I think that's one thing I am interested in, is that the interface between... Your, your private dreaming self, your subjective reality and the public reality and the world of literary tradition and so on that you engage with as a person and as a writer and how those two things shape each other and yeah. or touch each other in passing or whatever. So that was one of the things that I think appealed to me about that, that Seferis quotation, one of many things, um, was that sense of the, the very real presence of both of them and how mm -hmm. you might come out of one state into the other carrying some burden back with you yeah and that that trafficking across that line in some way and I hope that's something that my poems are doing or that are interested in doing at least is to to think about really the ways in which consensual knowledge you know the things that we all share the social knowledge the things that we agree upon are transformed and imaginatively contaminated when they come in contact with a, a living mind you know a, a, mm. a private space the penetralium of mystery was Keats called it. Um, there's a lot also here of um, ideas of, of instruments like GPS and the IUD, these kind of um, interventions, and but also these sort of borrowed structures um, and making structure a subject, um, structure an instrument a subject, as well as being something that you're obviously creating. Yeah, I think so. Um, so there's, there's a lot about structure and there's lots of poems about buildings yes. and ruined buildings and, and sort of bodies that are... Bodies, that architectural versions of the body. Yeah, and, definitely. Yeah. Um, the thing about the GPS and IUD was a sort of uh, a project I had to try and investigate that language of information in a way that made it more yeah. poetic. So yeah. these really utilitarian, ugly acronyms that we've been flooded with over the last sort of 20, 30 years um, to try and get into them in a way that would open up some kind of emotional space within them or some more lyric resonance in there rather than them being quite so functional as yes. they are. And in the poem, The, the Paperweight, which brings to mind, of course, Marianne Moore as well as uh, you know, sitting yeah. there beside Bishop, these lines, um, an airy utterance trapped in the glass, there's no remembering now where it came from, gift with no giver, a solid glass fruit, and for me, it, it felt like a, a real assertion of the importance of us detaching our material from its source and allowing it to become this artful and artificial thing, a poem, in order to hold its true nature mm. and, and its truth. And, that, and I thought the paperweight was a, was a lovely image of that. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that because for me, the paperweight is one of the most personal poems in the book. <laughs> I'm not surprised to hear so that either. I mean, it's partly, yes. yes, it's partly about the, the poem as a detached object that you, you've mm -hmm. in some sense externalised 
whatever impulses went into writing it and there's a, a, a closure there, a coldness and a distance that I think has to come at a certain point to let go of something that you've been writing. But there's also a sense in, in the poem in which the paperweight is whatever you were given as a child that you've carried through mm. the rest of your life as well and then the ways that your internal architecture was formed by your parents or the, you know, the circumstances mm -hmm. of your upbringing as well and you, re you, know, you, you come to various points of consciousness as an adult, don't you, where you think, well, why do I think this? I think this because, um, yeah. because that, was, that was something that the people around me thought when I was younger and you, yeah. you have no idea where it came from exactly because it wasn't something that you personally pursued. I suppose what I'm getting at is that the, the, the experience in forming a poem of uh, moving out of a, a, a deep personal truth to an essential truth Mm. through the one image. So you have a paperweight which will be invested with your personal associations and in becoming the subject of a poem, it, it carries with it. It's this, the essence is the same. The, what drives you to write the poem is particular things that you will have, it will enable you to explore sure. um, and formulate. But those truths become not so much yours as, as, as essential, and that's what the reader can get at. And I thought the sort of ceiling of the, the subject um, within mm. the paperweight, like the way we used to, I mean, in my generation, we, that plastic, did it, you know, what was it called? Where we used to pour plastic into moulds and just capture everything in, in deeply chemical, <laughs> deeply toxic. <laughs> All children's toys were very toxic then. Um, I think, I mean, there's, no, I, I know, and, and partly I suppose I think of poetry as a public dream, and that was one of the reasons yes. that attracted me well, to that what, phrase. That is a public dream, I think, so, that paperweight. Yeah, poem. and like a dream yeah. being something intensely weird, and that yes. normally you can't share with other people. You start talking to other people about your dreams, and it's just the most boring thing ever. Um, <laughs> but a public dream being something that it exists out there, and many people can enter it, and many people can experience the yeah, dream, and you can, you can what, share yeah. Yeah. the experience. I think it's a lovely phrase for a poem, a public dream, because it, it, does, it, it does reach from the absolute, absolute interiority to the point of shared connection and experience um, and doesn't focus on how we get there. Yeah. Um, so it remains water, it remains clear water, yeah. the experience of it.